Hello, hello, hello. Check out this awesome future pop music. I am loving it, but no, let's get rid of that. <laughs> um, good afternoon, good evening, good night, or good morning, wherever you are watching us from. This is Developing with Cockroach DB, a program that's developer focused. Uh, to you through a series of workshops and office hours to help you tackle your biggest developer aspirations and how can you get the most out of CockroachDB? How can we help you get the most out of CockroachDB? Um, hopefully you know a little bit of SQL, a little bit of Postgres because uh, it makes the transition easier. Uh, if you've taken some Cockroach University classes, if you're new to Cockroach Cloud or Cockroach DB Serverless, uh, bring us onto your journey. Let us know how we can help you streamline that experience. Um, to, today is a module on JSON optimization. Tomorrow is office hours. Same bat time, same bat channel, however you're watching right now. You can watch again tomorrow, office hours, which is basically an AMA. But also, if you have any questions that we don't get to today, we'll start with those tomorrow. Um, also, this is not your only channel of communication, but one channel to become excellent developers. We've also got Cockroach University, Slack, Forum. Uh, please let us know how we can help you. Um, and so I'd like to first introduce my experts today, starting with Fabio. Not even going to try to pronounce that last name. Fabulous enterprise architect. Fabio, tell me how you came to Cockroach Labs, how you started playing with data. Hi, hi, Arane. Thank you for having me here. Uh, yeah, my name is Fabio Girardello. Sometimes it's very hard to pronounce for myself too, but <laughs> I mean... <laughs> for cockroach with cockroach labs uh, for now over a little bit over a year and i uh, join as an enterprise architect i work with my with customers with enterprise customers uh, to deploy uh, configure and set up uh, cockroach db in their infrastructure cool and how did you get started with data so i started first at cloudera back uh, four years ago uh starting nice. in the big data space uh, uh I joined as a sales engineer Mm -hmm. First for the partner network, uh, then uh, um, moved into some other internal roles. Uh, and I had a great overview of uh, uh, really the entire ecosystem, because Cloudera used to uh, cover a lot of, uh, of uh, the edge to AI workflow. And now I and then I got a great opportunity to join Cockroach Labs. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's where I am. Nice. And also we have John St. John, also an enterprise architect. Tell me about your path to Cockroach Labs and data. Sure. Uh, like Fabio, I'm an enterprise architect. I uh, work with our, our customers on uh, build, uh, deploying and integrating Cockroach DB uh, into their systems, particularly their production systems, optimizing them. Uh, I've been here a bit uh, shorter time than Fabio, about three and a half months, getting close to four months. Yes. And prior, yeah, prior to this, I, I worked for a little bit of a, a different company. It was a, a privacy uh, startup um, working on developing applications to help people protect their privacy and also building a platform to offer that to uh, companies that want to do the same. And right. yeah, so I worked as in the solutions architecture, uh, also engineering space uh, prior to that. I uh, spent quite a few years working in application development, database development, um, cloud architecture, uh, those type of areas. So uh, it's been a great it's been a great journey to get here, and um, I'm loving being a part of what we're doing. Nice. Um, and I already have a question on here, uh, which I want to highlight before I introduce myself. David, yes, recording is always available on the YouTube channel. And that is youtube.com slash cockroach TV. I should, I should capitalize that a little bit better, but definitely cannot wait to hear what you hear. Think of the show, even if it's after or later on. And I am Reen. I am a developer advocate here at Cockroach Labs. I'm a bit of a data noob in that 
I played with it in the late 90s. I played with MySQL in the late 90s, early 2000s when I was a, um, a web developer. And I am back to it hmm. and getting to know distributed data and, and actually NoSQL and, and all of the fancy stuff. Thank you, Adrian. And thank you, David, for the question. Um, getting right to the point, though, we are talking JSON optimization. Talk to me about what we're learning today, Fabio. Yes, yeah, so today's uh, workshop or module is around uh, uh, how CockroachDB handles JSON objects, uh, support for JSON objects, functions available in the database, specifically for JSON objects, how to manipulate the data, extract data, uh, work with the data, and of course, op how to optimize it, how to improve uh, query performance, uh, how to improve uh, uh, yeah, the general uh, performance of the database uh, when dealing with the JSON uh, objects. Awesome. Let's get started. You want you're sharing your screen today, yeah, Fabio? Yes, I am. I am. I have a few slides. Uh, thank you for giving the permission. So here I have a JSON optimization. So here's the agenda. I like to start always with uh, three slides uh, for the architecture review. In case it's your first time you join uh, these uh, uh, live stream videos and you're not very familiar with CockroachDB or you are and but you slightly forgot exactly the few details, I have uh, three slides uh, that introduce. Uh, the area review the architecture and then we go straight to the uh, use cases for json uh, and, uh, and we drill down into the various points uh, uh, import out imported data uh, query um, using functions using operators uh, and uh, we conclude with uh, uh, performance uh, performance considerations uh, how do you can uh, what uh, can you use to improve your performance in querying JSON data? And we also have labs at the end. We're going to go through some labs uh, connecting um, my terminal to CockroachDB serverless and do some few exercises to consolidate the points that we discussed here in the slides. And those labs are already available on github.com slash cockroachlabs slash developer dash success. Look for JSON optimization, and those are Apache licensed. So you're welcome to play, give us feedback, everything else. Yes, exactly. So I'll share the link later on to when I when I go to my screen. So uh, let's go further review first uh, uh, the architecture. So CockroachDB is a dynamically distributed, a transactional key value database management system with a SQL interface. You as a developer will always uh, interface through uh, the SQL. So you always handle uh, communication with database uh, via, the, via, via the SQL interface. How is implemented? CockroachDB is implemented as a cluster of nodes where each node is equal in its function uh, to any other node in a shared nothing architecture. Each node is a master, each node is a gateway, each node is, a, is an executor. All, all are exactly the same function. Each node is implemented uh, is, in, is an independent process uh, that holds uh, both the database logic as well as a portion of the data and is also location aware. It knows it's part of a larger cluster. It knows how to communicate with all its peers. Transactions are distributed and are executed with the highest logical isolation level, the serializable isolation level. And therefore, we can guarantee that the transactions are ACID compliant. The database can then be, the data can be uh, geopartitioned, can be, uh, data can be pinned across regions and zones. And uh, we replicate the data. Such data is also replicated for resiliency. So we can claim that CockroachDB uh, has a zero RPO. So drilling under the hood, so what do we have there? We have a, a key value store. It's a monolithic key space, and it's ordered by key lexicographically. The store is cut into chunks of data. Uh, we call these ranges. By default, they are 512 megabytes, but it's configurable. Ranges are then moved based uh, on the activity and how you want to pin your data. Ranges are also replicated, and as we talked before, and, and, and spread across the cluster for resiliency. And every table, every index, every object really is, uh, is, is mapped in this manner into ranges. But you as a developer, you care, okay, I want to work with the SQL interface. So how does it, how does it look like? So here is a, what a relational table looks like when it's parsed into a key value store. 
the key holds the information about the table name, which receives a unique identifier across all databases, the index, the family, memory key, in this case, uh, you see is a column ID, but it could be a composite key too. And finally, you have all the values. And in the value section of the key value, you have all the other columns. So understanding the structure of the key value store uh, is fundamental when it comes to do anything related to query performance, query optimization, uh, geo partitioning, uh, all, all sorts of partitioning, and that characterize your deployment. And one final important note is that a table is basically an index. Um, and we sometimes refer to it as a primary. Uh, secondary indices are indices on another field of uh, primary. They depend on primary, but they can store also other columns. They can be exact clone of uh, primary, uh, depending how what you need to do for improving your query performance. Secondary indices also are automatically deleted if you drop the table. And that brings us to the topic of today. So uh, use cases for uh, for JSON. So when would you use JSON? So we see in the field, the majority of our use cases is really a migration. When customers want to migrate to CockroachDB, they happen to have data or some tables in a JSON format, and they want to know, uh, do we support Cockroach? Do we support uh, JSON? Do we support, do we support queries on that? So mostly, as I said, is migration from document store databases. Uh, we have other cases where uh, you, maybe your application needs to store some sort of payload. And, and you don't know what form this payload holds. Um, there are other cases where uh, the nature of the of the JSON object is dynamic. Sometimes you have some fields, sometimes you don't have them. So there is not a one-to-one -one map into a relational table where you can quite convert it. So in these, those cases, uh, using a JSON uh, object, uh, you still want to keep that. Is it, you want to stay with the JSON, at least for the moment, at least for the time being. And now, John, do you see anything on your side? Uh, any other use cases? So do this uh, look appropriate to you? Yeah, I think this looks good. I think the ones that I've seen uh, a bit are where you have sort of this long tail, maybe the third one, where you have a long tail of maybe properties. Um, one, one way to think about it might be like a, uh, <clears throat> like a store that might have thousands of different of, uh, types of products and then maybe over time um, you're adding and removing products so there's some things that will be really consistent between them think of like price or weight or something like that but there's going to be a lot of uh, characteristics of these products that you're not going to query on but you might be displaying to the user after you retrieve them um, or infrequently querying on them and we'll see some of those uh, optimizations on the json data for querying but in that case, you've got this, this kind of long tail of dynamic properties that um, you might, might want to store as JSON data. Um, and then the other, I think, is what you described as the payload data, where you just have some payload and it might be some deeply nested data um, where you, you know, maybe, you know, a lot of the data you're not going to query on. Um, you might pull it out with like a primary key lookup or some other method um, and then, then uh, But you need to store it somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so I think you hit on the on the major ones. Um, Adrian mentioned that it sounds like a good thing to use with a third-party API where you can't control the response. What are your thoughts on that? That you can control yeah. it with an API? What was the question again? Sorry, I think I got distracted. Where you can't control the response. Yeah. Yeah. So so I think the idea there might be that you have um, you want to be able to store that response and maybe mm -hmm. pull some data out of it. Maybe you store those in traditional columns, um, but maybe you want to keep the actual response. I think in that way, it's kind of that um, maybe that fourth uh, like storing a payload object where the response is the payload, and you have some structure where it may it may change over time. Um, I can see that being a use case. Yeah. What do you cool. think, Fabio? Right, yes. So uh, generally, we should have support for JSON, the object. We prefer to have uh, data stored as a uh, key value pairs. So that's generally what I suggest all my customers to have, if it's possible. But we recognize that is, there are cases where you just cannot get away with JSON, at least for the time being, uh, or you need to refactor your application in other ways. Uh, and the JSON have their use. So that's why we decided to support them. Um, nice. 
Yeah. And would so, you would you do this with a computed column? Yeah, there are various ways to optimize it uh, to handle data. Uh, you definitely JSON B is a, is an object type in a cockroach DB, so you can work directly as if it was a document store. Nice. But there are ways where you can, uh, uh, and yet we go later in the presentation when we talk about per optimizing query performance. So what are the cool. things that you can do to improve it? Uh, it goes from uh, the ideal is uh, removing the JSON object completely, but you can also have computed columns. You can have inverted indices. Uh, there are a few tricks. Uh, it depends on the use cases. Uh, what Where are you comfortable with? Yeah, cool. So first thing obviously comes to mind is uh, how do I import the data? So uh, you, we need to, we cannot ingest raw JSON. Uh, we we want to have it in a in a flat file like a CSV file or TSV file, as we will see later in our examples, where uh, and then you insert it that way. So you import it as if it was a a, a string basically. So here are some uh, some examples of how you would uh, insert uh, uh, into CockroachDB some SQL payload. So you can see that uh, we sub assuming that we have a table called uh, JTAB uh, that has been defined as a, a JSON object. Uh, we, we insert the values uh, like normal strings, uh, just the structure inside it happens to be a JSON, and the CockroachDB we store as a JSONB object. So, or you can, as I mentioned, that probably the most uh, preferred way is uh, importing a table or importing it into uh, from directly from uh, a TSV or CSV file located on the public cloud. And this data is delimited by a tab or by a comma, and you will import the data that way. On CockroachDB side, why is a string what you're sending over? We will be interpreting and saving it as a JSONB object which allow us to do all sorts of cool functions on top of it. So we have provided a rich set of functions. These are uh, around uh, querying the JSONB object, querying the keys, extracting data, extracting metadata. Uh, there is a lot of them. Uh, there is a good document, document uh, documentation available um, in online. We're going to go through some of those, some of the key ones uh, that are important, that we think are important, starting with the JSONB object keys. So here uh, you flatten per row as much as possible, and then you drill down into every object. So in this case, I'm, um, I've imported some data into a table called uh, JSON table. I've added some random JSONB object, and I want to find out for each one of these objects what is the, the key. and uh, these uh, JSONB object keys uh, uh, iterates through all the items and provides me with a, with a key as um, in the return message. Another similar one is a JSON B each that returns a, a, a list of tuples with uh, the key as well as the the payload, so the, the values. So very quickly, I can go through uh, all of them and return my message in the application as a list of tuples. Pretty convenient. There are operators. Uh, I pause a little bit here because I just want to go through uh, the three of them. Uh, the first two are very similar in one another in that they are. Um, the goal is uh, to extract data. So I open up the JSONB object and I want to drill down. Imagine there are multiple lay, uh, multiple levels inside the JSONB object. So it's a key value, and the value is another dictionary, and there's another dictionary. So how can I uh, drill inside of each of the objects? So th this operator allows you to do that. The first one returns uh, a JSONB object which I can then further query using the same operator over and over. The second one returns me uh, a string, which I can use to print uh, to screen or return the object it will be for your final value. Here are some examples. Fi the final example, I don't even know how to pronounce it. This is the contain operator. This uh, checks and returns a true or false uh, if uh, the left uh, key value uh, is contained within the right key value, within the right JSONB object. So very handy. Uh, it comes up. You you will see those uh, um, later in the in the labs how we make use of them to extract data, to query data, to make sure we do where clauses uh, in our SQL query. Is that is that an at symbol and then a yes greater than okay. yes it's an at symbol and a greater than 
okay. while the other one are some sort of <laughs> um, arrows. <laughs> So here are some examples because I think they, they speak more than words. Uh, in this case, what I'm trying to do, what we have imported this uh, table data that uh, contains acquisitions, details of US companies uh, against other US companies. So in this case, what I'm doing is I wanna uh, go inside of the acquisition dictionary, uh, acquisition uh, acquiring company and extracting the name as a string. Notice the double um, greater mm -hmm. operator and I call it acquiring company name. And then I go again and I want to acquire the year and then I want to get the, the amount. And then I pull a table. Quick question, Fabio. Yeah. The, when you're chaining together these, these operators, um, it looks like it's necessary if you're going to be kind of going deeper into the nesting that you need to use kind of the, the JSON B oper operator. Um, to, to kind of drill down and then eventually right. um, at the end, probably you would use the, the string operator to return the actual string value. Is that, is that's that correct? correct. That's mm -hmm. the, yes. So you, you use the, the first operator to extract data to drill down because that returns you another JSON B object. And finally, when you're ready to extract the data that you want, then you want to parse that as a string. There are situations where you actually want to cast it into an integer in case you want to do operat operations. And we're going to see that next. Well, what I'm doing now here is I want to have the sum. Um, so how much money was the, the, the cost of this, uh, those acquisition? So similar as before, I'm acquiring the company name. I'm extracting the, the uh, you can acquire the company name, the company name that was acquired, and the year. Um, in this case, we cast it as an int, even though really it's not necessary for a year. You don't do operations generally on years. But you do operations on prices. You do operations on this type of values. So in this case, I want to do a sum. So I'm doing an aggregation. But to do aggregation, I need to transform this string, price amount, into an integer. And I do that using the cast function. And then I can extract data. And here, I can also have uh, something in the where clause. So I can use my JSONB object and the JSONB operator to do some right filtering. I want to filter only those that Oracle Corporation acquired. So I can do that this way. And I'll, and here we see the first instance of using the contains operator, where we want to make sure that uh, it contains the is all US, US dollar, basically, uh, uh, acquisitions. And then we filter and we get our table. So now you will see immediately from here, we're doing a lot of operations on JSONB objects. There are ways to optimize that to make sure this is faster. So performance. Can, can I ask a quick question, Fabio, on that? Um, when you're casting, um, is if if the JSON value is store is an is an integer, like when you put it in, is it necessary to cast it? Is it always start a string, or is that a good practice? Well, you know, JSON is a string at heart, so it's just a structure. Mm -hmm string so if you extract data all data that automatically comes out is going to be string even if it's a number so yes it is necessary to cast the value into a proper format uh, for the aggregator operator for the aggregation operator like sum uh, average uh, medium minimum max min and etc so you would have uh, to pr to, pa to parse uh, price amount in this case uh, into a proper double or integer or any numeric uh, type. Got it. Thanks. Yep. And now that brings us really to the performance consideration. So, okay. Uh, you remember every time you do this sort of operation with JSONB, you're talking about CPU cycles because uh, you extracted the JSONB, you're drilling down and then you're further drilling down, then you need to cast it, then you need to extract it, and you need to do the same thing for the where clause. Those are Again, it depends on the use cases. Are you querying JSONB object all the time? Is it only every now and then? Does it pay out to optimize it? So that's a good question. So what do we offer here? So um, some good example. Uh, these are general uh, best practices. The first thing is uh, try to flatten as much as possible your JSONB object. Don't put the entire database as a single key value entry, because then you 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 haven't resolved anything. From our point of view, it looks like we have one single row where on the value side you have this JSONB object, which is huge and contains your entire database. Instead, the idea is you want to have one row per object. 
And then you can use, uh, once you have it this way, you can use the performance features, inverted indices, computed columns, and uh, column families. So we go first to inverted index. So what is an inverted index? So we create uh, for each one of the key inside of your JSONB object, each key inside of every dictionary inside the JSONB object, we create an index. And that allows us to go straight to the key that you're looking for once you do have a query like uh, this one. So assuming you want to select ID from uh, this uh, JSONB table, where uh, certain condition happens when in this case i want to see that the, my, my object contains uh, this uh, string c s after 19 equals to this value whatever and it takes uh, how many milliseconds so 655. now i want to create inverted index and what will happen for each one of the key which includes a c s after 19 there will be an index that has it in the in the key so the optimizer can leverage that index and go straight to what it needs to go. So doing the same query, look at now the performance improvement. It's 100 times faster. It only takes two milliseconds because it doesn't have to scan through the entire table to find out whether this is true or not. Inverted indices are very, very powerful. It's a quick and dirty solution to improve your performance. So here is an, another one. This is a very good example. Actually, we, we shy away now from the JSONB object. Uh, is a similar concept um, that applies to the array object, which you might, is something also you might want to work with. So this is the classical needle in a haystack. So what we have created is a table with a million rows that look exactly the same. That's the haystack. And then we inserted at the bottom here the needle which is a, a something that has a slightly different value. You see, is now it adds a 666. And then I want to query, OK, I want to have, want to find that needle. So find me the, where uh, the value is equal to 666. Well, it takes uh, over a second to find out, because he has to scan through each uh, one of the 1 million row, check the value, and find out if 666 is contained in the value part. That's a very slow operation. How about we create inverted indices? Well, performance speaks for itself, 1.75 milliseconds. So that's extremely fast. Good. I think uh, we, we got a point of inverted index. It's very easy. It's one command. CockroachDB does it all on your behalf. You don't have to do anything else. Just run that query, and your performance is going to be greatly improved. Another way to do that, uh, increasing performance, is uh, I think uh, rain. That's what you mentioned before, uh, computed columns. So you might want to extract the most used columns uh, that you query all the time uh, where in your where clause, on uh, your select clause, into native CockroachDB values in CockroachDB types. So that how, that's how you do it. So in this case, we use a different data set. We imported. This is a, um, about the data about restaurants. And we want to find out uh, uh, what is uh, what are the best restaurants uh, with the type of food, the curry, and uh, sort them, uh, do some some uh, some good operations. We can do all that using the JSON the object, no problem. The results comes out. But yes. if, I, if yes, if I can do it, however, over and over, and, and I really care about performance, then it does pay off to create computed columns for those uh, uh, specific columns that I'm querying all the time. So this is how to do it. So you do an alter table where you add a column and you specify it to be a store. And how do you create that column? You extract the data from another column. So in this case, I'm querying the JSONB object. So they give me the type of food and add it as a, a column called type of food that is going to be type string in my key value store. Once I've done that, then uh, what is going to happen? And then, of course, I create an index on that column my performance is going to greatly improve. So nice. here is the same query. Uh, this is left is uh, only using the JSONB object. And then the left side, on the right side here, is using the computed columns. And uh, you see the performance improvement uh, it does pay off. It depends on how many times you query, right, Rain? Exactly. Um, one of our LinkedIn viewers wants to know if if it's a better practice to issue a query against a JSON property using inverted index or computed index when available. Well, I guess it depends a lot on the use cases. Inverted index totally. is a is a is an easy way for having CockroachDB do it all on your behalf. 
But if you have a lot of keys, then it's going to be also be uh, a lot of data that you have to store. If you know exactly what you're looking for, you can go like with a surgical knife. Uh, yeah. It's a little bit more work, but computer columns offer a better performance overall. So uh, my my suggestion to all my customers is get rid of JSONB object completely. If you can afford it, if you can do that, then go straight to relational because you have the best performance. Where mm. it's not possible, try to use computer columns. When it, computer columns okay. are not possible, then uh, you go inverted indexes. And so okay. that's clear. That's clear. John, and do then... you see any name? Yeah, I don't, ahead, I think, yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't have anything to add, but I, I think that how you described it, you know, is a, is a good rule of thumb because not everybody, depending on your use case, you may not have the option mm -hmm. to either do the, the computed or, or otherwise. Um, exactly. And I think one thing that maybe we, I was thinking when we were talking about use cases is just, you know, there are sort of these anti-patterns of JSON use, which would be. You know, like well, you kind of touched on it, Fabio, which is just shove everything into a JSON <laughs> field yeah. because you don't want to have to figure out how to correctly structure your database. And that is not really the use case. Um, don't, it's, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. What we're showing here is really powerful or what Fabio is showing is really powerful for the use case where indeed it, it absolutely makes sense to store JSON or you, you need to for whatever reason. And then Adrian wanted to know when is the value computed? It's computed immediately. Immediately, nice. Yes, otherwise we wouldn't be able to create an index of it uh, and you wouldn't have a performance uh, performance improvement because uh, if yeah. it's computed on the fly, you will still have to do the work of extracting it and um, and inserting it into the index so that that wouldn't be a nice. performance improvement. Yeah. Nice. Um, David said thank you for the answer. Um, using the stored approach um, is what they're using right now, but he would love to get rid of them. <laughs> Let us know how we can help you. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with the stored approach. And by the way, if you have a change your JSON in that uh, you don't want to send that, so what you had as a stored column, you don't want to add it anymore through JSON. So you don't want to have cockroach be constantly at every insert extracting the data and putting it the, as a stored column. You can convert at uh, uh, some point uh, your stored column into a native column. Mm -hmm. And then you do just a normal insert and you just simply extract it. But that's uh, something you will work more in tandem with the application developer. So if you as an application developer, you have this. That's why I'm so I'm keen that the application developers actually know how the CockroachDB works a little bit under the hood, because they can do all this performance optimization. And eventually, they do pay off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Adrian was confirming that uh, the value is computed when it's added slash updated. That's exactly right, Adrian. Well, oh, so now uh, we last uh, a bit of performance. Uh, that's a bit on a different side on a tangent, but is using family groups. That uh, is a performance optimization that not only applies to JSON object, but applies to any big payload, bytes, uh, or uh, big string, uh, image file, whatever. You know, so, and any object, any column that you must store, but you don't really frequently update. You don't really use that much you just want to put it on another level you just didn't want to be in the same uh, uh, row as the other one is by using families with family you basically uh, put in a particular object in this case we're talking about json so you put the json object into a different family on the key value store that family will be stored in a different row adjacent to the other row but on a different row so if you need to update or query constantly uh, you, you query the data, but not the JSONB object or your bytes object or your big string object, uh, you bypass that. So you read less data and you rewrite less data. It's, it's a performance improvement. Obviously, if your query constantly queries also the JSONB object, then it has no performance improvement if you constantly read it. Uh, at this point, you can keep it in the same row. 
This is something that, again, is true not only for JSONB object, but in general for ev any big object that you must keep, like an image, think of an image file, some bytes, uh, uh, however, you don't query very often. And that really brings us to the labs, to the labs. Uh, uh, Raina, time check, is a good time to start with labs? Any other questions? You, how long is your lab? Oh, it's, it's about, you know, it's about 10 minutes or something that, that you should go through fast. I mean, we leave them as a to go also for uh, um, our audience and they can take bring them home exercise. They can do them on our behalf. It's very simple, especially with cockroach to be serverless. Uh, okay, we're good then. Go for it. I am, however, going to try a chat overlay. One of the things we do with these uh, modules is we are streaming over several platforms. Um, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitch. Uh, I think we're even on Facebook and um, and Twitter. Uh, and so, if you ask a question on one channel, you may we may accidentally answer on another. Something I'm going to try doing is adding this chat overlay on the side of our screen um, for. Uh, we'll do this in the future with everybody. Uh, from the beginning, but I'm going to see if if someone messages from LinkedIn, if someone from YouTube can see it. Uh, so feel free to just test that out. Um, we are now silent in our comments, but feel free to chat in there and let's see if we can see everyone's questions and answers on the left side of the screen. I'm so flipped. The camera flips, everything flips. Um, awesome. Thank you, Adrian. Um, so I'm going to leave that chat overlay on. Please let us know if you can no longer see, thank you, Cockroach. Let us know if you can no longer see the shared screen. We want to make sure that the information is shared first and the ease of use is a little bit lower down, but this is all about developer experience. And we want to make sure that you have the best experience possible. Let's start that lab. Yes, yes. So, so first, I, so I shared my screen of a Cockroach Cloud, so our database as a service offering. And this is really, and Cockroach to be serverless is really the best thing uh, after Apple Pie, because it's just so easy for developers to create a cluster and uh, just get started with it. You don't have to download it locally, starting it up, making sure it, it brings up again next time you switch on again your computer. Here it's always up and running, and it's free. So I'll actually go through an exercise on how to create a cluster. So I logged in. Login is free. Nothing. You don't have to pay for anything. I, I, it brings me to the cluster page. In this case, I already have a cluster up and running. It's called Qt Otter. Again, this is a free cluster, and it's going to be a free forever cluster. But I want to create one. I want to show you how easy it is to create one. So I go to serverless. It's still in beta. It's for free. I choose my cloud provider, which dictates basically what region I want to go to. At the moment, we have one in, uh, in the US, uh, one in Europe, and one in Asia. And uh, yeah, so it's again free. I choose my name if I don't like what is proposed. Again, confirmation that this is for free for you. And then I create my free cluster. And just check it out how long it takes to create your cluster. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. About 10 seconds. OK, done. The cluster is up. The cluster is up. It gives me connection parameters if I want to connect from the SQL client directly on my on my terminal, which is what we'll do. But if you prefer using dBeaver or uh, DB Visualizer or any other GUI, or GUI application, you have connection parameters, and it gives you details on how to do that. Very, very simple. And this cluster is up all the time. It doesn't come down if you don't use it. It's always up and running. Now, I already have one up and running already, which I already set up on my laptop doing all that downloading the key, and et cetera. So I'm going to connect here to Qt Hotter. So I hope you can see my screen right. Uh, I'm going to connect. Uh, this is a connection string. And I'm going to uh, here. I'm cluster is up and running. So uh, I'm connected to the database. And now I'm going to go through the lamps. The lamps are available on uh, the page that you suggested. And it, it gives you really details on how to do that. You don't need an extractor. It's all self-paced. Copy and paste is finally available on GitHub. So I can click this button here. And I will create now a table. 
uh, and insert some data. I'm going to import the data from uh, um, from GitHub, basically. I saved some data there. And then I'm going to count how many we see. So I'm going to do copy and paste. Makes it very easy. Create the table. Import the job is done. OK, one. So basically, we inserted the database. I want to show you how what this data looks like. So I'm going to copy this URL, open a new tab. Uh, so you see, it's a lot of data. Whoa. It's a lot of data. <laughs> how many rows do we have? One. <laughs> more than, I mean, what, more than three. That's not the wrong, <laughs> exactly. That's not the, wrong, the right way of importing data. Yeah. That's basically the goal of the exercise is uh, do try to flatten these as much as you can because uh, that will improve the performance of your queries. You wanna you don't want to have one key value row. You want to have more many one for each object. Yeah. But this data is helpful at least to go through the functions that we discussed. So this is what the data looks like. Of course, I showed you here, but it's hard to make sense unless you are an X man. So uh, this is basically what it looks like nicely formatted for a human consumption. We're going to go through some of these uh, uh, functions, the JSON be pretty. So I'm going to copy that and uh, let's go through some of this. I'm going to do the here. The JSON be pretty, what it turns me is a nicely formatted way of all the uh, key pairs. And here you see that I'm extracting only uh, the first level, that value zero. I think it's just the first item. If you, your key, if your JSON object is an array, and uh, you want to access the first item of the array that's i believe that's how you do it and then it, it gives me uh the key value pairs nicely formatted uh, that's good for visualizing json be uh, uh json be each however returns to my sql client a nice list of tuples so this is great because i don't have to create it on application side cockroach should be returns it from on my behalf JSON B object piece, very similar to before. It, it, it just returns me a list, a list of all the keys. Any questions so far? Brain, um, that's so, yeah, that's that first screen made my eyeballs bleed. That's that's awesome. <laughs> John, do you see this helpful? The, you, as a developer, you see this very helpful for the developer to be able to receive the keys uh, uh, straight from uh, uh, from the database without having to com compile it yourself or we'll compile it yeah compile it oh, yeah yourself. i mean absolutely i mean anytime mm -hmm. you're looking at json data the first thing you do is throw it into json pretty to look at it and i like these the key function as well um does it handle nested data fairly well yeah. like if there's levels of nesting where it'll will it output keys uh, nested keys or i know yes. you uh, yeah. So this is just the keys, uh, but in JSON B, uh, in this case, uh, I've just extracted. Uh, let me do something. Let's see. If I do where ID equals zero. I don't want to do them. Yeah. So it returns more data. In this case, I believe it's just a flat. It's just a one key and value, key value, key value. But it will provide you with the entire thing. Yes, if it's required. Cool. Yeah, that's pretty yeah, powerful. That's pretty nice. Okay, now we can drop the table. I don't need to tell you how to do that, but we're going to delete this data because it's pretty useless. And instead, we're going to import the data that is flattened. So mm. review, let's review quickly the raw data. Uh, what's the difference? So now you see is a TSV value. Uh, check on the top right is a zero and then a tab key. So this is the tab. I know it's very small. Let me make <laughs> a little bigger. <laughs> you don't see that on screen, but yeah, this is the key. And this is the tab, the separator, and then you have the JSONB object. And further down, one, the other ID, and then the tab. So this is a flatten. This is a flattened file. And I click here, copy, um, let's uh, paste here. And the data is soon be imported. Now we can see we have 110 rows. And now we can do something a little bit more interesting. For example, we can practice with operators. By the way, we have another only a few laps. So give me another two minutes and we're done. So here, I want to just extract uh, some uh, data. Very simple. Again, using the string operator, so fetch uh, or extract a string uh, and call it this name and count to do some basic aggregation. And then I want to do uh, the same thing uh, uh, by uh, summing the price. So again, with the cast function. So this is what it's going to look like. So I can create easily uh, my, um, I can extract the data and do some operations on top of it. 
So one thing actually, I was going to say, Fabio, I, I like this data because although it's um, like you could have created a data set that had like super easy to understand keys and all that stuff, it's actually this is pretty typical of what you see in like big chunks of JSON data. You're going to see a ton exactly. of properties, and you're going to be running these things, you know, to say what does this data look like? You know, print out the keys. You know, show me some stats on it. Those type of things, and being look probably looking for that, you know, needle in that haystack of JSON data that you want to actually query on. So this is great. hundred percent. Yeah. Now we're going to the fun stuff because it's query optimization. <laughs> That's what we do all the time. I find it very funny. So I inserted more data. Now we have about 15,000 rows and we want to do this query using native JSON B uh, um, syntax and see how long it takes. So it takes uh, uh, execution. Let's run it one more time. Execution is one second. So, okay, well, that takes a little bit of time. Let's do check the query plan. And uh, sure enough, if I do the query plan, I have this dreaded full scan. That's the first mm. thing we check as enterprise architect. Is your query doing a full scan? Because that's a no-no. We need to improve that. So we're going to improve it by making use of inverted index. In fact, I'm going to use a create inverted index on this table. Uh, it's going to take a few seconds to create. Once we do that, and we do the query plan, we will see that it's going to use the inverted index, which we have called index JSON inverted. Let's see if it's done. Yes, it's done it. Let's query the query plan. And sure enough, I see that it's using the JFlat is the table name, and then index JSON inverted is the index name before it was using primary. Mm. Primary, yeah, the, the details is right here. And so now I know that to find this data, I just need to span through this very little data. So it's extremely fast. And sure enough, I do the same query again. How long it takes me? One second? No, it took me two milliseconds. By the way, check this out. The time here is uh, the, the sum of the execution plus the network. So I'm in Long Island. Maybe it took a little bit of time to go from but it, but it accepted it up in Ohio, Iowa, I don't know, but it took two milliseconds to execute this query. Okay, so uh, I, prob I think I'm conscious of time. We're going to skip the joints, but joints are supported operation. You can do joints on JSONB objects. I'll let you read through it. I actually, I'll really invite you to go through the labs. Yes. Yeah? Yes, please go through the labs, people are there, and github.com slash cockroach labs slash developer dash success. Look for JSON optimization. Cool. The last one I want to go through, Rain, because you asked, is about the computed columns. So let's do the same exercise with and without computed columns. So here is a good example where I'm running a query, and sure enough, it takes 334 milliseconds. And uh, then I want to do the explain plan. So I want to ch check exactly what is happening. And I'm going to see that it's doing a full scan. So mm -hmm. which is a no-no. Why? But it's a, we thought we had inverted indexes. Yeah, but inverted index do not work uh, for um, filtering for in the where mm -hmm. clause. Not use even though I have it. I, so the, it's not going to be able to leverage to do this piece of the SQL query. So what I need to do is uh, um, do computer columns. So uh, let's create a clone pretty much of this, uh, but com using computer columns. While this is creating, let's review a little bit what I'm doing here. So I'm creating a similar table as before, again, with the same JSON B object, but I'm adding our seat as a stored computer column and extracted from the JSON B object. And the same with other 19 and our price. These are the uh, columns that I needed in my uh, in my query. So the most used columns, I want to make sure I extract them to native uh, CockroachDB columns, and then I'm ready for doing again my um, my query. See how that works. So I do the explain plan. Now it's created. Let me do the explain plan on the newly rewritten query that outputs the same values. Okay, so uh, sure enough, I am using a filter uh, and I'm using the, the right index. So as you can see, I have a limited amount of, of data to check and that will improve my uh, performance tremendously. So let me rerun the query. How much did we saw it was running before? 334 milliseconds. So how much is it now? 20 milliseconds. 
So it's a great look. So it's a little bit of work to figure out how to extract it. Yes, I need to create another column. You know, might be a little bit of work as some of the people in the chat have mentioned that they want to get rid of the stored columns. But they're helpful. So it's worth to go through that and, um, and do computed columns if, of course, you are querying uh, all the time. If it's only once a month, then probably it's not worth doing that for sure. Nice. Nice. James, thanks. John, any any considerations here? <clears throat> no, this is this is really great. Um I think you mentioned uh maybe maybe one limitation on inverted indexes. Are there situations um or do you want to kind of recap what situations inverted indexes kind of won't help a query? Right. It was in the where clause. So mm. you have an item in the where clause. Let me go back to the uh, the lab here where I said, OK, I want to have uh, a query. My query says, uh, OK, give me this data, uh, select whatever, where my flat, uh, and then extract this data, where the, the CS after 19, uh, um, let me do it bigger. Hopefully, you can see my uh, is equals like is like a star, you know, mom. So contains this M O M string, and you can say, well, sure enough, it should be easy to do that with an index, but not with an inverted index. That will not work with an inverted index. I can do that if I have a computed columns, and that's what we did when we rewrite. We have rewritten this as a computed column. So I can do where after 19, like nine. So this looks more like standard SQL, right? It's not. Mm -hmm. I'm not extracting data from a JSONB object, and I'm do, I'm doing it directly on a computed column. So something cockroach to be native, and that's why I get this such a performance improvement. That's why the optimizer is able to leverage that. So inverted indices are are great. Don't get me wrong, but they have some limitations. Got it. That's oh. great. And is there? Do you have any rules of thumb maybe for using computed columns uh, oh. on JSON B objects, like uh, either uh, kind of workload type patterns or even like number? You know, like you don't probably don't want to create like fifty computed columns on your JSON B column from your JSON B column. But what's your recommendations? In try start with extracting as a computed columns uh, the most used columns in your queries. Mm. And especially if they have to be casted as an integer, if they have to be casted to some other um, type that is not mm. string, uh, because you need to do aggregation, because that will improve. You always need to think about it. Okay, what is gonna cockroach is gonna do with my JSONB object? So you need to extract it. There's a big file like this. Then you need to get only this bit of data, and then uh, another piece of data. And then I need to cast it as an integer so that I can do a sum of it. It's a lot of CPU cycles. It's a cycle to go through. So mm -hmm. how can I make it short? So why don't you just simply take it and put it as a column directly along with the other objects as a native column already stored as an integer or as a double? It's much faster. So mm -hmm. you need to think about that terms. I know the developers don't like thinking maybe uh, nitty gritty stuff like this, but it does pay off. And again, we as enterprise architects, are, that's what we are here for. We are but using everything uh, under the sun related to deployment, but also query optimization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we did a query optimization module. Let me get that link for you. And the module is available on GitHub as well. <laughs> oh. The link is quite long. It is on the right. Right. Yes. And again, those are all self-paced labs. You can do them quickly, uh, um, independently using Cockroach Cloud. The, mm -hmm. And I really like the serverless one. It's, it's free. I don't have to bother about bringing it up, bringing it down. I just need to clean up after myself, you know, dropping the tables. But it's always up and running. It doesn't cost me anything. <laughs> Why not? I mean, it's so easy. Yes. And if I want to scale up, if I need to want to try out something bigger, I can always do it for a limited amount of time and scaling it down when not needed. So only it's a pay-as-you-go consumption. So, yep. That's all for me, Rain. Back to you. Any other ah, questions? That was awesome. 
Um, I've put the query optimization video. It's saved on YouTube. Um, definitely uh, want to remind people, if you are watching this somewhere other than YouTube, be sure to subscribe on YouTube as well. Um, and the reason for that is, well, personally, uh, I find that the the inter chat interface and the viewing is is more intuitive, but also you have all of these uh, videos are available in our library. It's the only place where all the videos are saved is on YouTube. But yeah, and does anyone have any questions? We have another minute. Uh, is, is John's dog still sleeping? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, we totally, also we wanna see the He's dog. Sleeping. I am going to maximize John a little bit. Um, the puppy in the background of John is an older boy who yes, 13. mostly sleeps. So, and he, he uh, off he was, him right there. Yeah, he was having a dream earlier Aww. where he was making his little <laughs> whimpering noises and, you know, moving. It was, it was really cute. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm with Adrian. We need a dog cam for the fourth, oh, yeah. that fourth is a person, good idea. fourth guest. Um, oh, yeah. Definitely. That's, that's a great idea. <laughs> cool. He is very relaxed. But I, yeah, that was a fantastic presentation, Fabio. Um, thank you, John. 100%. Yeah. Um, if you are interested in hearing more, be sure to subscribe to YouTube or wherever else you are watching the stream. Um, tomorrow at the same time on whatever channel you're watching, we will have our office hours, which you can ask questions from today. You can also ask us anything about Cockroach TV or Cockroach Labs. Um, neither one of you are joining me tomorrow, are you? It's actually... Um, I forget. It's two other people. <laughs> two other people. <laughs> it's it's office hours with two other two other enterprise architects experts. Mm -hmm. I will be here um, in the next few weeks. Our next show is two weeks from now, and we are going to talk import backup restore. John, that's you, isn't that? Is that two weeks? So I better get to work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, so import backup restore, that's definitely an important subject. No? Okay. Yes, absolutely. It's one of the key <laughs> um, in every single deployment uh, without uh, the capability to do backup, restore, import, or export. Uh, it's hard to be production ready for that. So uh, yeah. absolutely. Uh, I want to hit some some use cases for for import for getting up and running on Cockroach serverless if you have an existing application that you want to get running we'll be looking at some data sets importing some data sets and seeing what kind of issues you might run into how to solve them those type of things awesome awesome and if you have any questions be sure to visit us tomorrow because as for today the music started so we gotta go uh let us know if you like the chat overlay over there um or if it's too crowded if you couldn't see the code let us know all questions count all feedback counts and we'll see you on slack there we go there's the link um let us know as always how we can help you on your developer journey and for today have a great day we will see you tomorrow thank you john thank you fabio and we'll see you next time Bye. Take care.